Hey everybody, I'm Ryan Doyle. This is the Rarity Degree Table, where I teach you how to play Dungeons & Dragons, how to become a better player, and eventually how to become a Dungeon Master and run your own game. But you gotta start somewhere, and we're starting here with this series. I'm calling it D&D &D 101, where we are gonna go through the basics of the D&D &D rules. And you know what you need to know mechanically to get your foot in the door to start playing this game. Dungeons and Dragons comes with a rule book that is essentially a textbook. Um, if you don't have your own copy of that and you've been playing this game for at least a little bit, you're going to want one. Um, so one way to get it, I have a link down below to my Amazon affiliate link. If you buy it through that, that helps me out a bit. If you would prefer to go get one from your you know, local game store or a smaller bookshop that has a halfway decent game section, uh, yeah, by all means, go for it. Sub support those fine folks. But uh, if you want to pick it up online uh, and support this channel, then yes, please. Uh, I'd appreciate it. If you're poking around down there, also like, subscribe. That YouTube algorithm stuff actually does really help me. Um, but yes, all of that aside, today we are talking about skill checks and saving throws. The basic rhythm of Dungeons & Dragons play is the Dungeon Master, the DM, describes a scenario, kind of sets the table, and once they've done that, they are going to ask, what do you do? What does your character do in this world, in this space? Um, and if you decide that your character is going to try to do something that is challenging, that it's possible to succeed or fail at, then the Dungeon Master is probably going to end up calling for a skill check. So if the Dungeon Master were to describe a low ceilinged room covered in the dust of untold centuries with a stern-faced statue of a dwarf standing guard on the opposite side from where you've entered, the players could maybe, you know, decide to check out that statue or examine the, you know, dusty floor for tracks, for footprints, or maybe someone wants to go around and search the adjoining walls for secret doors. These would all probably be skill checks. So skills get their own column on the character sheet and each skill is associated with a certain ability. So you have your ability score modifier associated with each of those abilities, each of those skills. And some of those skills we're going to be proficient in. We're gonna have filled in the little bubble beside them because of you know choices that we made in character creation, be it from our background or from our class, we are going to be proficient in some of those skills. So we're gonna add our proficiency bonus as well as our ability modifier. And that's how those numbers get there. We fill out that table uh, once, or at least once per level, and then we're just referring to it. We're not adding that number up every time. That's there on the character sheet for us to see. And what's that, what that's telling us is how much we add or subtract to a d20 roll when we make our skill check. So let's say we wanted to, you know, take a closer look at that statue, not too close, mind you. I'm going to stay on this side of the room and see what I can see about that statue. Then the dungeon master could reasonably ask for a perception check. So that would mean that I, as the player, would roll my d20. 16, pretty solid. Um, check out my uh, perception under skills, and I'm getting plus two from my, oh no, I'm sorry, I'm getting plus one from my wisdom modifier, and I'm getting plus two from my proficiency bonus. So it's plus three there next to perception. So I take that plus three and the 16 that I got on my die roll, and that's 19. So I got a 19 on my perception check. Pretty good. However, it is dark in this room down here in the dungeon. We're not carrying a light source because we all have dark vision and we don't want to like tip off any enemies that might be nearby. So in fact, my dungeon master informs me that I'm making this check at disadvantage. I'm rolling this d20 twice and I'm taking the lower results. So two. Uh, in this case and a lot of people you know forget this rule or kind of just you know uh, conveniently forget this rule um, just because my character maybe I'm playing a, a half elf or one of the many races that has dark vision just because I can see in darkness I'm not entirely blind down here without a light source um, I see as if it were in dim light which means at disadvantage right it's not a perfectly well-lit space where I can perceive things across the room without any impediment. 
Um, I am making my perception check at disadvantage. Yeah, you're probably doing dark vision wrong. Rolling at disadvantage, my two in this case gets added to the plus three, so five on my perception check. Not very good. Odds are I don't pick up any additional details about that stern looking dwarven statue across the way. Uh, at least from here in the doorway. But let's say, for example, I was in fact, you know, carrying a lantern that was lit and that 19 that I originally rolled stuck. Um, I might get, you know, some more detail from the dungeon master. The dwarven statue holds a, an ax above their head and the, your light just catches glints off of the edge of it shining um, a little more uh, sinisterly. It's not all stone, there is in fact metal in the construction of this statue. Alternatively, you know, not all perception is sight. Perhaps I pick up the scent of a cooking fire, a campfire on the air, um, implying that, you know, perhaps in one of the other adjoining rooms or, you know, in the recent past, someone had a campfire or a cook fire, you know, in the neighborhood of where we are now. Okay, let's say that five stands. We don't have a light. I couldn't really see much of anything in here, so I decide to to light a light or maybe someone else in the party decides to light up a torch or light up a lantern they can just do that most of the time that's not going to be a skill check as long as you have a torch in your inventory or a lantern lamp oil uh, however granular you want to get as far as like inventory control as long as you have what's required to light a torch you know your dm is probably not going to make you roll a skill check it just happens you don't have to roll for everything now, if this temple, you know, contained a portal to the elemental plane of Earth and there was a constant, like, draft blowing through every, every space, um, then, yeah, maybe lighting a torch is a challenge. And, you know, maybe it is something that they could potentially fail at, um, even if they spent a long time doing it. So then, yes, I would, as a dungeon master, I would call for a skill check, maybe sleight of hand, I guess, probably just dexterity. Um, which raises an actually another good point. I say skill checks, a lot of people say skill checks, but um, by the book, it's an ability check, right? Your skills are modifying your abilities because you might be proficient in a skill, but all of those skills default back to abilities. So if you're, you know, attempting to do a task that doesn't fit neatly into those, what, 18 skills, then your dungeon master might just call for a dexterity check or a strength check. All right, so, you know, one of us in the party lights a lantern, no problem, and searches the floor for tracks. Um, that is typically going to be a survival check. So we're going to roll a one. A one. Um, cool. So, yeah, we're not gaining a lot of clues. One, obviously, is the lowest thing you can roll on a d20. Um, and this is also instructional. There's there's different ways to play it, right? R raw, R-A-W, rules as written. Um, you don't necessarily have critical failures and successes on ability checks, on skill checks. Um, however, you can. I see this argued about a lot. Um, I'm, I'm going to actually put the... the player's handbook no i think it's the dungeon master guide uh page reference down here in editing for you um because i see a lot of people debate this online um and it's it's optional it's at your dungeon master's discretion and it's at the table's uh discretion whether or not you want to play that <laughs> rolling a one on a skill check is a fumble is a critical failure um, it can be that I take my one and I add, I'm not proficient in survival, so I get my, just my plus one wisdom modifier, so I get a two um, as a result on my survival check while checking for, you know, footprints, tracks, whatever I can discern, um, which is, you know, fail, no result, no, I don't learn anything, there's nothing that I at least pick up in the dust on the floor of this dungeon room. But we can play it that that one is a critical <laughs> failure. And, you know, I am uh, walking around the room following a trail of footprints uh, disturbed as it uh, appears to be a multiplying uh, party as more and more creatures join this set of footprints until I realize to my own embarrassment that I'm following my own footprints around this room and ha 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 um, or or potentially I disturb um, some you know 
a corpse in a suit of armor, maybe knock it down a well and alert, you know, the denizens of this dungeon that we are here. Fool of a took. Now, this is more beginner D&D and not Dungeon Master focused, but here we are. So, you know, for your DMs out there, I typically will do, you know, ones and twenties as significant on skill checks as well as, you know, rules as written attack rolls. But you do want to be careful. I won't necessarily do it every time or I won't do it like all out every time. Um, because it can get a little slapsticky, right? Which can be a lot of fun and lighten the mood and like whatever. We all love a good laugh and like we have a lot of fun at my table. Um, but if you're trying to make things like gritty or you're trying to, you know, portray your, your PCs as competent, heroic, um, you know, actors in the world, then, you know, if 5% of the time they step on a rake and hit themselves in the face, like, okay, that kind of undercuts that whole idea. Um, also, whatever, if somebody uh, is potentially going to have a, have a complete disaster on their hands every time they, or 5% of the time they try to do anything ever, um, that might actually like make your players a little gun shy about doing anything, which is, is not great for gameplay, I'll tell you that much. All right, end tangent, um, <laughs> searching for hidden doors, uh, secret doors in the walls would be an investigation check most likely. Sometimes if we are very creative um, in our actions, maybe we're using, again, going into our inventory and taking out a dagger and trying to like find chinks in the mortar between the stones or we go around the edge of the room sprinkling our bag of sand checking for drafts right which would betray uh, a passageway behind the wall or something um, you know if we're creative one that makes for a better play experience for everybody um, but two maybe if we're lucky the dungeon master is in a benevolent mood and maybe gives us advantage on the check so instead of running rolling 1d20 we roll those 2d20s and opposed to disadvantage where we roll where we uh, take the lower number uh, with advantage we take the higher number which in this case is six we're, we're throwing rocks tonight um, yeah so six plus my so zero is six um, so no odds are I'm not finding any secret doors in this room today but again, for the sake of an example, let's say that that was a 20. Let's say I got a critical success. I got the highest number possible. Um, at some tables, or you know, some of the time at some tables, and ultimately I think that's the answer, that's the balance point. Um, some of the time, that 20 is gonna represent nothing other than 20, and you add your modifier, and that's the score, right? So if, you know, 20 plus zero uh, is, 20 um if the dc right if the the difficulty class the dc how hard it is to do this thing if this door is exceptionally well hidden and the dc is 21 um then my 20 doesn't make it and i don't find it um but you know let's say a 15 is a more reasonable dc for a fairly well hidden door or 20 is like a very difficult hidden door whatever we'll do dcs at a different video for you dms out there um but yes even if I roll a 20, even if I get a critical success and we're playing that way and there's no secret door in this room, right? It's not, it's not on the map. It's not, it's not there. There isn't a secret door. Our 20 doesn't magically make one appear. Um, I see players and dungeon masters fall into this trap a lot. They think that 20s are a miracle, right? Um, if we are one, not playing that way where, you know, 5% of the time that one is a complete disaster then yeah, it doesn't make sense for that 20 to be a miracle. Um, it also cha it changes the game, right? And get, this is your game at your table. If you want, you know, 10% of the time to be crazy pants, then go for it. That can be a lot of fun. That can make a compelling story, um, whatever. I generally fancy a more realistic uh, f fantasy game with magic and dragons. Um, so again, it's all a balancing act. But I see a lot of players, you roll a natural 20 um, in a room with no secret doors on your investigation check. That means that your player is, you know, as confident as they can be that there is no secret door in that room. As the dungeon master, maybe the player rolls a nat 20 and 
it makes sense or it, it, it fits story wise, game pace wise to have a secret door in that room and it's your world, it's your game as the DM. If you decide, you know what, yeah, there's a secret door here that wasn't there a second ago because that character rolled a natural 20. The players are none the wiser, everybody celebrates and if it, if it makes sense, if it feels right, um, trust your instinct at, you know, the majority of the time. If it, if it makes sense and it doesn't break the game or, you know, the, the map in this scenario, um, then yeah, by all means, go for it if it feels right. But you're not required to create a secret door or like you discover um, a magic weapon because you rolled that nat 20. Um, some players are going to expect that, but that's not necessarily how it goes. This introductory D&D video is getting a little more advanced than I anticipated, uh, I think because I'm doing some DM prep uh, on the side here. Uh, but it's okay. I think it's actually a good thing for you to, you know, see things from more angles. Sometimes it's not the player, you know, acting that's going to create a skill check. When we walk into the room, the dungeon master, you know, might set the table, set the scene, and then ask the dwarf member of the party to roll a history check or a, a religion check or, you know, whatever, straight intelligence check to see maybe if they recognize the features of this dwarven statue in front of them. A point of Dungeons and Dragons etiquette here, generally the player isn't going to roll the dice until the dungeon master asks them to, right? Um, at a lot of tables you'll see players go, I make a perception check on the statue and they're rolling away. But the dungeon master, you know, one might just give them the information for free. There's no need to roll. There's no success fail here. You see this. Um, alternatively, the dungeon master might decide that it isn't a perception check. It's an investigation check or again, maybe some other skill. So, I mean, it's not the end of the world, but generally it is good gameplay to wait for the DM to call for the check and not just say, I do this, blah. So in this example, when the barbarian, um, no, no, the, the rogue, when the rogue goes and you know tries to take the ax from the statue, they don't just say, I'm gonna make an athletics check and roll it, they're gonna wait for the DM because the DM might say, no, it's, it's just a straight strength check. Um, or in this scenario, the DM might say, make a dexterity saving throw. Now, a saving throw is very similar to an ability check. Um, we are pulling the modifiers from those six ability scores. There's six saving throws for the six abilities. Um, and we also have proficiency in some of them. Odds are we have proficiency in two that are determined by our class. So for those two, we also get to add that proficiency bonus. Um, again, they perform very similarly. We're going to roll that d20, add the modifier. We are making skill checks when we are trying to do something. And we are making saving throws when we are trying to stop something from happening to us. So the rogue with their hands on the axe trying to pull it free. Uh, here's the grinding of stone on stone as the eyes of this dwarven statue open revealing two black pits with little pinpoints of light deep within them that get brighter and brighter until flames come shooting out of the eyes of this statue creating a 15 foot cone um, so the rogue and anyone who happens to be unfortunate enough to be standing around them at the moment uh, is going to make a dexterity saving throw to get out of the way of the fire. The rogue is going to be proficient in dexterity saving throws and probably has a pretty good dexterity modifier. So for our rogue, let's say it's a 15 and we're going to add four to that, probably five to that. So that's 20. Um, so good for them. They're taking half damage here in this scenario. Whereas the Dwarven Cleric in, you know, half plate beside them, seeing if they could recognize the face of their forefathers or their deity in the eyes of this statue um, is probably taking the full... Bro oh, 18. All right. Not bad. So everybody's taking half damage here. Um, good for the Cleric. Disadvantage? Because no. Okay. Um, so that is 6, 7, 8, 13 points of damage being dished out by this fire trap that the rogue has triggered, but they both made their dexterity saving throw, so that gets cut to half. So they're both taking six points of damage. 
because in D&D, we round down. All right, so following this scenario, the cleric is probably understandably upset with the rogue for getting them burnt up and, you know, whatever, maybe defiling this holy site to the dwarves' people. Um, and the rogue is probably unconcerned and checking out their sweet new axe when they both stop hearing the grinding of stone on stone again as the dwarf statue's mouth opens and the sickly thick green noxious gas escapes filling the room and now everybody in that space is going to make a constitution saving throw so now every player is going to roll their own d20 and add their character's constitution saving throw modifier to that number if it meets or beats the dc the difficulty class of uh you know this poison gas trap then if they if they meet or beat that then they succeed and they resist the effect but if they roll lower than the dc they are now going to be poisoned and every skill check that they make going forward including attack rolls are going to be at disadvantage until they are cured by whatever means so that skill checks and saving throws pretty simple perform pretty similarly you can think of skills as actions and saves as reactions um, that can get you into trouble because in dungeons and dragons actions and reactions have a very particular meaning in combat and that's what we're going to be discussing next time the meat and potatoes of dungeons and dragons is fighting monsters you will hear from other sources that that's not all this game is about um, and that is true and also revealing because that is a lot of what this game is about uh, it is one of my favorite you know real-time strategy combat games and we are going to talk about that in the next video but until then get out there have fun, take care of yourself and be kind, and I'll see you next time.